So welcome, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Jeremy Levy. I'm the director of the Pittsburgh Quantum Institute. And um, I'd like to welcome uh, all of you uh, to the, the signature lecture from the signature event of the Pittsburgh Quantum Institute. We've been in business since 2012. Um, and um, we have a, a, a three-day event every year, uh, usually in April, and it was fractured. Um, and um, one of the, the biggest shards uh, landed in the middle of August. And um, I will let uh, Rob Rutenbar, who is the Senior Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, give the introduction to our speaker, Rob. Well, um, thank you, Jeremy. And uh, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing Scott Aronson who's our speaker today, who's the David G. Bruton Centennial Professor of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, there are just so many ways in which we may know about um, Scott and his works. So some of us are gonna know him as a, a deep theoretical computer scientist working on the most frontier kind of questions in, in uh, com complexity for quantum information systems. What can you compute? How hard is it? When, why, and how? Some of us are gonna know him from his, from his physics. Um, since Scott superposes across a bunch of departments in the traditional academy these days, um, I would be remiss if I didn't note the, the, the well-received photonic uh, boson sampling work. Um, some of us are gonna know him from his book. Some of us are gonna know him from his awards, the Waterman Award from the National Science Foundation. He was recently elected a fellow of the ACM for contributions to quantum computing and computational complexity just last year. Congrats, Scott, I just saw that one. Um, go by. Um, I hope many of us know him from his blog, Shtetl Optimized, All Things Complexity and All Things Quantum. I hope many of us also know him for his sense of humor. I mean, who else publishes a nature physics, a nature physics paper titled Read the Fine Print, right? Um, which is then a sort of a slightly acerbic take on what's real and what's not in, um, in quantum computing. I think somewhat fewer of us, you know, know his apparently deep and abiding passion for American college football because something has to explain why he moved from a pretty solid regional boutique technical university in Cambridge, Massachusetts to a power five conference in, 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 uh, in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Uh, actually it was totally the, the football. Yeah. Shuttle blog post where he was musing about whether it would be, uh, whether it was going to be possible to rename the Longhorns the Hedemards. I'm not sure where you ended up on that one, Scott, you know, you can probably tell us with, I'd buy the coffee cup. Mm -hmm. Um, Scott's gonna, uh, gonna talk about something very recent and very interesting, the recent Google quantum supremacy result, the one where Google said yay, and then IBM immediately said nay, and things got interesting. Um, I look forward to seeing Scott adjudicate this one for us. So Scott, welcome, and thank you so much for, for being here and being able to give this talk. Yeah, well, well uh, thank you so much, Rob, for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I was so sorry that uh, I was not able to come to Pittsburgh in person. I had been looking forward to the trip. I have so many friends, um, you know, across multiple departments at uh, uh, in, in in Pittsburgh, and I, you know, and, and and I look forward to visiting in person after COVID is over. Um, so, um, uh, so should, should I do like like a, a one hour and then questions? Is that good? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, good, good, good. So um, this talk is uh, called uh, Quantum Computational Supremacy and Its Applications. Uh, now, uh, I, I am a uh, theorist. I am not at all an engineer. So in particular, you know, uh, I was, uh, you know, this, this uh, I, I will uh, talk about this recent achievement uh, uh, by, by Google of, uh, you know, or, or claim of, uh, uh, quantum computational supremacy using a uh, superconducting device. Uh, uh, I was not certainly not involved in building the device. Uh, you know, the achievement uh, is all theirs. Uh, I was involved in some of the theory uh, that led to the idea to uh, do such an experiment in the first place. And so I want to, you know, tell you about that, tell you about, uh, you know, how confident are we uh, that you know something was done that was really hard for a classical computer to simulate. Um, what do we even mean by that? How do we think about such questions? Um, now you know, although I'm not an experimentalist, I have uh, you know uh, you know I have visited uh, the Google Lab and, and other labs uh, enough times that I can tell you that this picture here is not exactly what 
quantum computer looks like. Uh, that's just when you do a Google image search, that's, uh, that, that's one of the things that comes up. Okay, so, um, so I guess the first thing that I should do is try to summarize quantum computing in about one slide. And uh, you know, this is not easy to do, uh, but uh, what I like to say is that you know, quantum computing is actually much simpler than a lot of people uh, imagine that it would be uh, once you take the physics out of it, okay? So uh, uh, you know, we have to say something about you know, what is, uh, um, you know, well, what, what is quantum mechanics, right? And uh, you know, I uh, prefer to think about it just in the context of, uh, of, of uh, models of computation. So, uh, you know, a computer we can think of as just uh, some um, um, physical object that has a state, okay? If it's a deterministic classical computer, then the state could be a string of n bits, okay? So there are two to the n power possible states uh, for that computer, okay? And, uh, you know, the initial state could be something very simple, like all the bits are zero. And then we can do a sequence of logical operations on the bits. Like for example, um, flip the third bit, but only if the fourth bit is a one. Okay, so you know, operations typically act on only one or two or three bits at a time. Okay, but they can do things that couple the bits together like that uh, and, and then change them. Okay, now uh, even before we come to quantum mechanics, you know, we could do something a little bit more than that which is that we could allow for probabilistic operations. Okay, so we could say, for example, uh, take the first bit in our computer and replace it by the outcome of a random, of, 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 of a fair coin flip. So zero or one with equal probabilities. Okay, and uh, you can think of that as just branching the possible states of the computer, right? So before it had a determinate state like zero, zero, but now its state is zero, zero, or one, zero with equal probabilities. You know, of course, uh, uh, if you looked at it, then you would see that it was just one or the other, okay? But if you don't look, then you have to describe your knowledge of the computer state by a vector. In this case, a vector of non-negative real numbers adding up to one, which we call probabilities. And notice that even if we only have n bits in our computer, uh, to describe a probabilistic state of the computer, uh, we'll in general need a list of two to the n probabilities, right? One for every possible configuration of the bits, you know, every possible string, because the bits can become correlated with each other. As you see in this picture here, like if I set the second bit equal to the first bit, well, now my two bits are zero, zero with probability half, and they're one, one with probability half. You know, so observing one of them would tell me about the other. Okay, so I can do a sequence of operations like that. Um, you know, so, so generally like linear transformations of my vector of probabilities, that is what the operations will look like. Uh, stochastic transformations okay, that, that uh, preserve that the probabilities add up to one. Uh, and then at the end, uh, of course, I have to look at my computer, you know, to see an out. And uh, the, um, you know, I, I never directly see the probabilities, right? They just determine which of the discrete outcomes, which of the two to the end discrete outcomes am I more or less likely to see, okay? And one way to think about it is as a branching tree of possibilities. Uh, so, I can think of it as the probability that I will see a given string X is just over all the possible paths through you know, the, the branching tree of possibilities that could have led to that string X of the probability of following that path, where the probability of a path is just the product of the probabilities of all of the transitions along that path. Okay, now if, if all of that made sense, then that's good because quantum computing is just a slight change to everything that I just said. Okay, and the one change is that instead of probabilities, now we talk about a different kind of number called amplitudes. Okay, uh, amplitudes uh, uh, can be positive or negative, uh, and they can even be complex numbers. Okay, and uh, if I have a, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, an object that can um, have some amplitude for being in one state and some amplitude for being in another state. We uh, say that it's in a it can be in a superposition of the two states. Okay, and a qubit, the building block of a quantum computer, is simply a bit that can be in a superposition of zero and one states. So it has some amplitude to be zero, some amplitude to be one. Um, so as an example, I could start with two qubits in the state zero, zero. I can then do an operation on the first qubit that puts it into a superposition. So let's say there's an amplitude for one over square root of two for it to be zero, amplitude of I over square root of two for it to be uh, one. And the rule now is just that the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the amplitudes always has to be one. Okay, so again, we're gonna maintain that something adds up to one, but now it's the two norm of our vector of amplitudes, okay? And uh, then at the end, we measure and we don't see the amplitudes any more than we see probabilities. We see some particular string, let's say X, with a probability that's equal to the squared absolute value of the amplitude for that string. Okay, and now once again, the amplitude of a string can be thought of as just the sum of the amplitudes for all of the possible paths that could have led to that string. Okay, and now we come to sort of the key point in all of quantum computation with every quantum algorithm. And um, well, the, uh, 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 which is, uh, not that we uh, surround these uh, strings with little cats. Uh, that, that we do do, but that's just a matter of notation. Okay, the key point is that uh, uh, amplitudes being complex numbers can interfere with each other. Okay, so uh, if I have a, a, a string X and some paths that lead to X had a positive amplitude, but other paths leading there had a negative amplitude, uh, or they had pointed in all different directions in the complex plane, then they can interfere destructively and cancel each other out so that the total amplitude is zero, okay? Uh, which means that then that uh, uh, string would never be seen at all. Even though if I had blocked some of the paths, then the amplitude could be positive or negative, and then that, that, that outcome could be seen, okay? So to say that again, by decreasing the number of ways for an outcome to happen, I can actually increase the chance that it happens. Okay, that is what interference means. That's what we see in the famous double slit experiment. Okay, and uh, with every quantum algorithm, uh, the goal is somehow to choreograph things in such a way that for each wrong answer to your computational problem, each answer that you don't want, some of the paths leading there have positive amplitude, some have negative amplitude, you know, they interfere destructively and they cancel each other out. Whereas the paths that lead to the answers that you do want to the right answers reinforce each other, okay? If you can arrange that, then when you look at the computer, you will see the right answer with a high probability. And of course, if you don't see it, you always have the option to just repeat the computation several times until you do, okay? But uh, the key points are, you have to arrange this interference pattern so that it happens quickly, you know, uh, ideally exponentially faster than a classical computer would have been able to do the same thing, right? Our goal was to get a big speed up over what a classical computer could have done. Uh, we need to do this even though we don't know in advance uh, which answer is the right one ourselves. Uh, you know, if we knew that, then there wouldn't be much point, right? So we have to arrange an interference pattern where we have some mathematical guarantee that it concentrates the amplitude on the right answer. And of course, we want to concentrate a lot of amplitude on it to get a high probability of the right answer. Okay, so this is a really weird hammer that nature provides for uh, solving computational problems. It was, you know, it took more than a decade for people to really discover, you know, any interesting nails for this hammer to hit. Okay, with one exception, I mean, when Feynman and others proposed the idea of quantum computing in the early 80s, uh, they knew that it could be useful for simulating quantum mechanics itself, okay? for uh, you know, learning about chemical reactions and you know, other things that themselves involve these interference phenomena. Okay? But um, 
it's really not obvious how you choreograph this interference pattern to do anything uh, uh, faster than a classical computer would be able to do the same thing. But that is what all of quantum computation relies on, whether we're talking about uh, the, the classic quantum algorithms like Shor's and Grover's algorithm, or whether we're talking about the quantum supremacy experiments that I'll be talking about today. Okay, uh, now uh, almost every popular article, you know, that's been written about quantum computing has uh, said something that's, you know, very misleading. Uh, said that, you know, well, a quantum computer just tries all the possible answers in superposition, right? And it's true that a quantum computer can try every answer in, you know, can create a superposition over even, you know, an exponential number of possible answers. Um, you know, after all, you know, the key point here, the key source of the power is that if I have n qubits, and if th those qubits can be, you know, uh, correlated with each other, or as we say, entangled, uh, you know, uh, then in general, I need to describe their state, I'm going to need a vector of two to the n amplitudes, right? And, uh, you know, if, if there's only, even if there's only a thousand qubits, which I could get from just a thousand spin one half particles or something like that, uh, two to the thousand amplitudes, right? That is more than could be written down in the whole observable universe. Okay, so you do have this exponentiality sort of at your fingertips, so to speak. The trouble is uh, that, well, if, if I just took an equal superposition over all the answers and just measured it, not having done anything else, then the rules of quantum mechanics tell me that all I'm going to see will be a random answer, right? A random string of n bits. And well, if I just wanted a random string, I could have picked one myself with a lot less uh, trouble, right? I could have saved myself billions of dollars in, you know, engineering costs. Okay, so so again, uh, the you know, um, um, just like with probability distribution, you know, I have this exponentially large object, but I can never quite get my hands on it. It disappears as soon as I try to look at it. Okay, but I do have one new trick at my disposal, and that is the fact that these amplitudes can interfere with each other. Okay, so that was the theory. Now, how do we actually build a quantum computer? Well, as many of you uh, probably know, there are a whole bunch of approaches uh, that are being pursued in parallel uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, you know, uh, no one has yet invented the quantum computing analog of the transistor. Like no, no one has invented a technology uh, uh, for, for qubits that is so, you know, that is as inherently reliable as a transistor is, and that would let us scale up to millions or billions of qubits, uh, uh, all, all interacting with each other in a, in a programmed way. You know, people are working toward that. Uh, you know, that is exactly what quantum error correction, you know, is, is hope to someday provide. Okay, but for now, we have a lot of ideas um, that, are, that are being pursued, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, qubits, just like classical bits, can be physically instantiated in many different ways. Uh, so you could use uh, the, um, uh, the, the spin states of atomic nuclei, like ytterbium nuclei, as your qubits. Uh, this is what's done in trapped ion quantum computing, which is being pursued by uh, companies like IonQ and uh, uh, in, um, out of Maryland, Honeywell in Colorado, and a bunch of others. Um, and, and they can now you know, do experiments with, with you know, many dozens of trapped ion qubits you know, forming pretty complicated entangled states. Um, you know, and they, 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 they manipulate, they, they trap them in a magnetic field, they manipulate them using lasers. You know, it, it's quite impressive what they can do. Um, you can also use called atoms uh, as with Misha Lukin's group at Harvard. Uh, and they can actually do stuff with several hundred qubits, uh, which, you know, by some people's definition would be quantum supremacy. You know, they can do things that we don't, like quantum simulations, that we don't really know how to uh, efficiently simulate classically. Um, you know, the, the, the issue is that we do not have the degree of programmability that we would like with these systems. So mostly you just build a system to do, you know, a, a very small number of things or to do one fixed thing. 
Okay, uh, there are photonic qubits. So you could use uh, the polarization mode or other modes in a photon as your qubit. Uh, that's being very aggressively pursued by Psi Quantum, which is a startup in Palo Alto and by others. Uh, then there is uh, topological quantum computing using non-abelian anions. This uh, is uh, an approach uh, that is, uh, I'll say, that is sort of speculative, even by the standards of quantum computing. Okay, uh, but this one is very famously being pursued by Microsoft, you know, which has placed a huge bet on this approach. Um, you know, it involves very beautiful mathematics. Uh, you know, uh, the, you know, if if you could create uh, these um, excitations that behave neither as bosons nor fermions but as a third type of particle called anions, uh, and you know, which would be confined in a two-dimensional medium in some condensed matter system. It's been proved that just by braiding these anions around each other in an appropriate way, you could do a universal quantum computation. And furthermore, these anions have some sort of natural error correction built into them. You, know, you have to change their topology to cause an error. Okay, so um, the only catch is that to make this work, you have to create a new state of matter, which has never been seen before. And, and so far, uh, zero topological qubits have been demonstrated. Okay, but you know, there are some people who still hold out the hope that that, you know, that could ultimately uh, be the right way to go. Um, now, the approach that I'll mostly talk about today, maybe the most popular one right now, is superconducting qubits. Okay, which is being pursued by Google, also by IBM, by Rigetti, and by a bunch of others. Uh, and the, this involves qubits that are quite enormous by the standards of qubits. Uh, you can, I believe, see them with a magnifying glass. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, these are coils of wire, uh, you know, around which a, a current with many billions of electrons can flow. And the currents could flow in two different states which are a little complicated to describe, but you know, why we can just take one state to encode a zero and the other to encode a one. So a current can store a bit, okay? But the point is that the, uh, um, uh, this chip is then placed into a dilution refrigerator. That's this upside down wedding cake down here, okay? And it is cooled uh, to, well, as close to absolute zero as you can, ma as you can manage. Uh, typically today, it's about 10 millikelvin, okay, about a hundredth of a degree of absolute zero. And um, when uh, the, the currents are, are that cold, uh, they superconduct. As you know, superconductivity is a uh, many body quantum effect. And in particular, it means that now the currents can flow in superpositions of the zero and one states. Okay, so now they behave as qubits. Okay, and, and then crucially, uh, there are um, these Josephson junctions, which are little control elements uh, on the qubits that let you control what each qubit is doing and also cause each qubit to interact with its neighbors. So the qubits are laid out in roughly a rectangular grid and each qubit can interact with its neighbors. We have classical control electronics that are coming in from outside the dilution fridge into the chip and telling each qubit exactly which of its neighbors to interact with when, okay? So, so in that sense, the device is programmable, right? We can have it run one quantum circuit and then you know, a hundredth of a second later, run a completely different quantum circuit, okay? That is the sense in which this is a computer at all. All right. So why is it so damn hard to build to actually build scalable quantum computers? You know, why are we still talking about devices with 30 or 50 or 100 qubits rather than with millions of qubits? Well, the difficulty in building a quantum computer, you know, has been understood, you know, since the very beginning of the field. Uh, the main problem is decoherence which means um, unwanted interaction between a quantum computer and its environment uh, that has the effect of prematurely measuring the, the quantum computer, prematurely collapsing its state. Okay, so, uh, you know, I said before that when you, you look at a, uh, a quantum system, you know, you see one particular outcome like X, 
with probability that's equal to the squared absolute value of the amplitude of X. Okay, but that's not all that happens. The system collapses to whichever outcome you saw. Okay, so once it makes a choice, it sticks with it. Um, or, you know, uh, 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 at least as far as we're concerned, that's what happens. You know, the, uh, uh, if, if the other outcome is there at all, then it's in another universe that is not accept that is no longer accessible to us. Um, and crucially, it doesn't have to be us who looks, okay? Any interaction between the qubits and uh, the air molecules, the radiation in the room, the, uh, the wafer that the qubits are on uh, that has the effect of carrying away the information about was that qubit a zero or a one uh, will have exactly the same effect on the qubit as if someone had measured it to ask it whether it was a zero or a one, okay? It will collapse it. So what this means is that to build a useful quantum computer, we have to keep the qubits incredibly well isolated from their environment Okay, so they, they have to sort of keep their secret, uh, you know, hold, hold their counsel about what state they're in, uh, but they can't be perfectly isolated because they have to interact with each other in a prescribed way. And we have to tell them how to interact with each other. Okay, these um, difficulties are so enormous that, you know, there, there have been people who thought that building a scalable quantum computer would just be fundamentally impossible. There are still some such people. Okay, but uh, the thing that changed most people's minds uh, in the mid 1990s was a profound discovery called quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance. And what this said is that you don't have to get the qubits perfectly isolated from their environments in order to do a universal quantum computation. You merely have to get them very, very, very well isolated. Okay, uh, in particular, uh, it was shown that as long as the rate of interaction between each qubit and its environment is made sufficiently small, you know, like, uh, um, you know, maybe, you know, a less than one in a million or one in 10,000 chance of an error per qubit per, you know, certain interval of time, then you can encode the information you care about uh, using very clever error correcting codes. Uh, so that one logical qubit would be encoded across an entangled state of many physical qubits uh, in such a way that even if any small percentage of the physical qubits are to leak their states into the environment, you are continuously monitoring. You can detect that when it's happened and you can correct for it. And, and you can, uh, the, in, the information that you cared about is preserved and you can just keep going forward, okay? Now, unfortunately, we are not there yet, okay? No one has yet demonstrated, I would say, you know, useful quantum fault tolerance, okay? And the problem is, you know, when you're, um, you know, so I, I, I should say, um, um, you, know, you know, there has been incredible progress, you know, in the, since I, since let's say I started in this field about 20 years ago, right? Uh, 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 you know, there, there have been improvements in se several orders of magnitude in the gate fidelities that were achievable, like, you know, uh, uh, the coherence times achievable, like factors of a thousand or, or more uh, improvements. Okay, but it looks like to get to quantum fault, to get to the threshold where quantum fault tolerance becomes a net win, there are still a couple more orders of magnitude to go. Okay, and Unfortunately, quantum fault tolerance is a little bit like a nuclear chain reaction, uh, uh, you know, in that like if, you, if you're halfway there, it's not half as impressive, right? If you, if you just do, if you're just half of the way to error correction, then each round of error correction that you try to do, you know, could just make things worse instead of making them better, okay? So, you know, I'd say, you know, the, the central engineering goal of this field since the beginning has been to get the qubits to the threshold where you can use these error correcting codes in order to simulate better qubits, which could then in turn simulate better qubits and so on, so that effectively we would have perfect qubits. Okay, we are not there yet. Okay, but in the meantime, uh, you know, what ca can we do anything in the meantime that would at least demonstrate the point that, you know, useful quantum computation is possible in the real world? 
Okay, so this is the question of quantum supremacy. So the term uh, quantum supremacy uh, was coined by uh, my good friend, the physicist John Preskill in 2012. Um, Preskill has since expressed some regrets about this name because, you know, of course the word supremacy has some very unsavory connotations, but, you know, I feel like, um, you know, better, better quantum supremacy than any of the horrible kinds of, of supremacy. And, um, you know, the, 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 for better or worse, the term is sort of stuck. So what did Preskill mean by this term and, and what will I mean by it? Uh, so uh, what he meant was um, he was trying to talk about the first use of a quantum computer to solve some well-defined problem uh, faster than any currently available classical computer uh, running any currently known algorithm. Okay, so the first use of a quantum computer to do something that we have really, you know, good reason to believe is faster than we could have done the same thing with a classical computer. Okay, now uh, I want you to notice a few things. I did not say a useful problem, okay? The problem does not have to be useful for anything. It only has to be classically hard, okay? But although the problem does not have to be useful, uh, I will insist that the problem be well-defined. Okay, so in other words, uh, if someone wanted to try to match the quantum computer's performance with a using a classical computer, then it ought to be completely unambiguous, you know, what it is that they are supposed to calculate, right? And the problem ought to be merely one of they don't have enough time to do it. Okay, so what this means is, you know, so 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 some people will will. Uh, 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 when, when they hear about, when they first hear about quantum supremacy, they'll say, well, look, you know, there are all sorts of molecules in the lab where, you know, no one quite knows how to calculate their ground state or, you know, fully solve their Schrodinger equation. So why couldn't we just, you know, and, and it's because of some, you know, uh, many electron quantum effects. So, so why couldn't we define any one of those chemicals? just be a quantum computer that solves the problem of simulating itself, okay? Well, you know, I'm not going to count that. I mean, I think that that, that could be the, the, a, a first step toward quantum supremacy, but I'm going to require a hardware independent definition of what is the problem to be solved. Or another way to say it is that in order for me to count something as a computer, uh, I will insist that it be logically possible that that thing output a wrong answer, okay? Nothing ever, you know, uh, fails at the task of simulating itself, okay? But, uh, you know, I will insist that there be some independent standard against which we are judging our quantum computer to have either succeeded or failed. Uh, this is related to, although it's not the same thing as programmability, okay? We want to be able to sort of tell our computer which problem it should solve. And, you know, and ideally, you know, uh, we would have one device that would solve a huge number of different, you know, problem instances, okay, as is the case with the, with the Google device, for example. Okay, now, when I say that, you know, I want a problem to be, or, uh, uh, a problem to be solved faster, you know, what do we mean by faster, right? And some people will say, well, you know, uh, uh, is the goal with quantum computing to do things only a thousand times faster or a million times faster or a billion times faster, right? And then you, you, know, you have to explain that in quantum computing, what we're really after is asymptotic speed ups, okay? So we're after scaling advantages, ideally exponential advantages, right? Where as we went to larger and larger problem uh, uh, instance sizes, the advantage of the quantum computer over the classical one would become greater and greater. If we had an exponential advantage, then it's perfectly plausible that we could do something in a few minutes with a few thousand qubits that with uh, any classical computer that's currently on earth might take longer than uh, the age of the universe. Okay, so that is ultimately what we're after. But you know, uh, any quantum supremacy experiment is just a single finite thing, right? It is not asymptotic. So how can we judge whether the experiment has succeeded? 
So I basically have a three prong test for that, okay? The first prong is do we, in the crudest sense, have an actual observed speed up where we are doing something, let's say in a few minutes with our quantum computer that uh, takes any, anyone else days or weeks or months to simulate with the biggest classical computer that they can throw at the thing and with the fastest algorithm that they know, right? That's just the crudest you know, way of saying you know, speed up by a few orders of magnitude, okay? But I want more than that, okay? I want uh, a theoretical argument that this actually is a problem that has an asymptotic separation between its quantum and its classical complexities. Okay, so I want to, you know, I want, I want there to be a case that this is not just a speed up by some fixed factor, which, you know, might, uh, might have nothing to do with quantum mechanics for all we know, right? It might just be a function of, you know, you've built some special piece of hardware that's fast at simulating itself. Um, you know, I want, I want reason to believe that if we scaled to, from 50 qubits to 100 or to 200 qubits, then the advantage would become much greater, okay? And thirdly, I want a causal connection between the asymptotic speed up and the observed speed up. So when anyone asks, how was the quantum computer able to solve this concrete instance, you know, 10,000 times faster than the fastest classical simulation available, I want no one to be able to explain it in any way that does not make reference to, well, you know, there was a, a space of quantum states whose dimension was like two to the 53rd power, you know, it was like nine quadrillion or something. And some, you know, and all of those amplitudes were being harnessed in a superposition, okay? I would like to rule out any explanations other than that one. Okay, good. So, you know, the way that I like to describe it is that for me, quantum supremacy is targeting what I, what I always regarded as the number one application of a quantum computer, right? So people talk about a few different applications of quantum computers. Uh, you know, maybe the most famous one is uh, Shor's algorithm, which could, you know, factor huge numbers and break almost all of the encryption that currently protects the internet. Okay, another application of quantum computers would be Grover's algorithm, which gets a smaller speed up. It's only a square root factor, but it has a much, much broader uh, range of applicability, all sorts of uh, machine learning and optimization problems. Uh, then there is quantum simulation, um, you know, which is maybe the most important uh, uh, practical application that we know about. You know, even if it's the most obvious one, right? Uh, you know, that could help in designing new materials, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, high, um, high efficiency solar cells, all kinds of things like that. Okay, but for me, I like to say, you know, all of that is just icing on the cake for me, right? And you know, I would, I would still want to build a quantum computer, even if they had had no applications besides just refuting all the people who said that quantum computing was impossible. Okay, uh, so I've shown, you know, some of the skeptics, I mean, these are some of the most distinguished physicists and computer scientists, um, you know, who have uh, argued, you know, in many cases continue to argue that just quantum computing speed ups are impossible in our world. You know, and I should be clear, you know, I regard that as a possibility. I think that if that turned out to be true, then you know, that would be more exciting in a way than if the quantum computing proponents are right, because that would really be a revolution in our understanding of quantum mechanics, right? Something has to really, really be wrong with our current understanding of physics in order for scalable quantum computing to not be possible, okay? The idea that, that quantum computing can work, like the theory says, is the more boring option, okay? It is the more conservative option. Uh, but either way, we should try to find out, you know, what is the truth? Just like, you know, we built the Large Hadron Collider or we built LIGO to find out what was the truth about the Higgs field, about gravitational waves. You know, let's see, what is the truth? Does nature actually provide this, you know, exponential, you know, computational resource? Okay, 
So this brings me at last to uh, the Google quantum supremacy claim, which was, you know, surely, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the biggest quantum computing news, you know, of the last year, and you know, and and and, and there was some very tough competition, I think. Uh, you know, there was a lot of exciting news, but this uh, this is something that um, you know was a, a milestone that uh, you know uh, um, you know had been people had been working toward for uh, uh, for for some years, and uh, uh, you know I I'd expected to be traveling the world giving talks about it before COVID shut the world down, and now now uh, now I, I give virtual talks instead. Okay, but um, uh, last fall. Um, Google had a paper in uh, Nature, it was actually the, the cover of Nature's 150th anniversary issue, uh, where they um, claimed to have achieved uh, quantum supremacy uh, using uh, this 53-qubit uh, ship called uh, Sycamore uh, that they built in their lab in Santa Barbara. Um, actually, what happened was that uh, they, um, um, you know, they, they, they had given their, their paper to, uh, to NASA for review, and, and NASA accidentally leaked the paper by putting it on their public website. And so it got uh, out all, all over the world before the Google team was even able to comment on it. And so, you know, for better or worse, my blog became a uh, clearinghouse of information about it because I was not embargoed in the way that uh, the Google team was. Okay, but what what is it that Google claimed in, the, in, this, in this paper? So they built this chip called Sycamore. Uh, it has 53 qubits. If you're wondering why 53, it's a strange number. Well, they built 54 qubits and one of them didn't work, okay? which you know, apparently is, is common uh, when you fabricate these chips that you, know, you, get, you get a few failures. And um, as I said, it, the, the, the qubits are laid out in a roughly rectangular grid and each uh, of the qubits has controllable couplings to its nearest neighbors. Okay, now using these qubits, they generated some samples from some probability distribution that we could call D. Um, and this was a, you know, so they measure each, you know, after doing a sequence of operations, they measure each qubit to see if it's a zero or one. And this gives, us, this gives them a 53-bit string. And then they just repeat the exact same computation over and over to get many independent samples from the same probability distribution. Okay, actually, uh, the truth is because of the noise in their chip, the uh, distribution that they're sampling is not quite the D that they want. It's something that's more like 99.8% the uniform distribution. Okay, so just completely random bits plus 0.2%, you know, uh, a, a bias, you know, to, you know of, of the distribution D uh, that, 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 that they want. Okay, so it's the sort of, they're, they're seeing outputs that are mostly noise and just a little bit of signal. Okay, but the good news is that the chip is extremely fast. Okay, it can take each of these samples in a few tens of microseconds. And what that means is that after a few minutes, it can take millions of independent samples, okay? And, uh, and then having extracted all of these samples, you then do statistics on them, okay? And a few million samples is actually enough to extract a signal, even amid all of that noise, you know, given enough classical computer power. And that is what they do. They extract a signal uh, uh, corresponding to this distribution D, uh, uh, which is sort of the signal of, you know, of actually doing something, you know, uh, correlated with this quantum circuit that they wanted, which is a quantum circuit acting on 53 qubits with a circuit depth of about 20, okay, about 20 layers of gates. Um, and then sort of a crucial part of the argument is they then argue that no classical algorithm, at least that they know of, would have easily done the same thing, right? Now, to be clear, anything that a quantum computer does could be spoofed by a classical computer given enough time, right? Because you could always just write down an explicit description of the entire quantum state, right? But, you know, such a simulation would be exponentially slower, okay? And so, um, so the hypothesis 
the conjecture, if you like, is that if you wanted to simulate this type of experiment using a classical computer, then there is nothing much faster that you could do than just that brute force simulation that would take time exponential in the number of qubits. Okay, so Google published an estimate that said using the fastest algorithm that they knew, running on the fastest supercomputer that they had available to them, uh, this simulation would take, uh, classical simulation would take about 10,000 years. Okay, now, uh, as we know, or as we'll see, that, 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 and that turned out to be over-optimistic. Uh, you know, there, there is a much faster classical simulation, but the fastest classical simulations that we know are still taking, you know, they're still brute force. They're still exponential in N, and there is still a gap of some orders of magnitude between them and the time taken by uh, the quantum sampling device, by, by, by Sycamore. Okay, so let's step back and talk about, you know, why was Google sort of pursuing quantum supremacy in this way? So, I mean, you know, like, like you may have felt like, well, you know, I was promised Shor's algorithm or Grover's algorithm or, you know, simulating, um, you know, the chemical reactions that make fertilizer or, you know, something, something sexy and exciting. I don't know if fertilizer is sexy, but, you know, something, something more exciting, okay, than just this sampling, these probability distributions. So why are we doing this? Okay, well, unfortunately, um, things like Shor's and Grover's algorithm, I mean, they would be great if we could demonstrate them, right? You know, with Shor's algorithm, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's a, what's especially nice is that if we factored, say, a 4,000 digit number, then verifying the results would be very, very simple, right? It would be easy to check that, uh, that the resulting numbers, you know, uh, really were factors of our original number and, and even, even that they're really prime. Um, uh, with these sampling problems, we do not know how to get that efficient checkability, okay? And that is a major drawback, okay? But uh, uh, with, with Shor's and Grover's algorithms, the issue is that we just do not know how to implement them in a way that would give a, a speed up uh, without much, much better qubits than, than any that are available today, okay? And in particular, uh, you know, we seem to need, uh, you know, it seems likely that we would need error correction, which could incur a huge overhead, like many hundreds of physical qubits for every logical qubit. Okay, so that's sort of not feasible in the near term. Okay, so that brings us to a very different idea for how to demonstrate quantum supremacy. And this was, um, as far as I know, first discussed in a uh, 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 prescient paper in 2004 by Barbara Terhall and David DeVincenzo. Uh, and the modern push for it kind of started a decade ago with uh, independent works by uh, me and Alex Arkhipov and also by Bremner, Joza, and Shepard, okay? And the new idea is to demonstrate quantum supremacy using sampling problems. That is problems were unlike with factoring, there's not a single right answer. There is a target distribution that you're supposed to sample from, okay? So there are many, many possible, you know, valid answers. The question is just, are you outputting them according to the right kind of statistics? And, um, so uh, the advantage of sampling problems uh, that we uh, realized is that first of all, there are sampling problems that are just much closer to the native physics of the devices that could be built you know, uh, in the near future. So you don't need nearly as much expensive encoding. You know, it is way more feasible to demonstrate a hard sampling problem with say 50 or 100 qubits. But then secondly, uh, you know, maybe less obviously, if all you want is evidence that your problem is hard for a classical computer, then sampling problems are actually uh, excellent for, 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 for that purpose. Okay, and you know, and, and the, the point that Alex Arkhipov and I made a decade ago with our paper about boson sampling uh, was that, uh, um, you know, you could, um, uh, you could even have uh, 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 sampling problems where if a classical computer could efficiently uh, output samples from the exact same distribution, then the polynomial hierarchy would collapse. 
Okay, if you know what that means, great. Uh, if not, you could take my word for it that it's bad. Uh, it was, you know, it would be sort of almost as much of a shock for complexity theory uh, as if p were to equal np. Okay, so you know, in the present state of complexity theory, that's about the, you know, that's close to the strongest evidence that we could hope for that that that, that something is hard. Uh, now, um, it's. It's, you know, and, and, and Bremner, Jose, and Shepard, you know, reached a similar conclusion about a different model called uh, commuting Hamiltonians. Uh, now, it's true that, you know, when you do a real experiment, uh, there is a lot of noise in it. And also, you never directly know what was the output distribution, right? You have to apply some tests to it. So then you have to, you know, think about what would be the hardness of just approximately spoofing this test. You know, and then and then things do get murkier. But even then, I would say that the evidence that these problems are classically hard seems to me at, at least as strong, possibly stronger than the evidence that say problems like factoring are hard for classical computers. You know, which is something that uh, of course no one has proven either. And there are many uh, mathematicians who think that maybe that's false. Maybe there is a fast classical algorithm for factoring. Okay, so um, the disadvantages of these sampling experiments, well, until very recently, they were thought to be entirely useless for anything other than just disproving the skeptics of quantum computing. Okay, we'll come to, back to that point later. Okay, then a second disadvantage is how do we check the results? Okay, so with, you know, these um, sampling uh, uh, based supremacy experiments are sort of very much targeted to the present stage of quantum computing hardware, where we have devices with 50 or 60 qubits. Because to verify uh, the sampling calculation with 50 qubits, it turns out it will take us about two to the 50th time, at least as far as we know how to do it today. Now, two to the 50th time, you can just barely do that using you know, a lot of supercomputing power, okay? But if these experiments were done with 100 qubits, then even if they were done, you know, even if it was done uh, correctly, we might never be able to verify it. Okay, and you know, by the way, we don't even know how to verify it using a second quantum computer. Okay, you really do seem to need two to the n time to verify these things, and you know, and that that is a big issue. But you know, at least within the in the present era of like fifty qubits, we can see a very large gap in performance. Okay. So now, what more specifically did Google do? Okay, well, so, so I was part of the uh, conversation with, with Google that happened in about 2015, you know, when you know, they, uh, they knew that they wanted to build a chip to do quantum supremacy, and they were talking to the theory community, you know, people in the theory community about, well, what should they do that you know, people would be as confident as possible really is hard to simulate with a classical computer. Okay, and they wanted to do something like boson sampling, but something more targeted toward their hardware. Okay, and so the best proposal that we were able to come up with was actually an extremely simple one. And it's just, well, someone challenges the quantum computer by sending it a random quantum circuit. Okay, so a random sequence of say one and two qubit uh, nearest neighbor unitary transformations. Uh, those, you know, are gates. Those gates can be staggered, like I'm showing on this in this animation in the left, um, you know, in such a way that after just a few layers of gates, you know, every qubit can have propagated a signal to every other qubit. Okay, uh, and so we do uh, as many layers of gates as as we can while still maintaining some coherence, and you know, and then we we ask the quantum computer to you know measure each qubit in the zero one basis. Uh, you know, and that, that gives it a sample, um, which, you know, we could call the first such sample S1, uh, a sample from some probability distribution, say, you know, D sub C over, over N bit strings. And now we can ask the quantum computer to keep doing that over and over, let's say K times, where K is a few million. So now it's generated uh, K independent samples from the same distribution. Okay, the distribution that you get by just applying these gates to, let's say, the all zero initial state and then measuring them all in the zero one basis. Okay. And then here's kind of the, the crucial part. Now, given these samples, these S1 up to SK, 
Now we, with our classical computer, have to do some statistical test to them to check, did these really come from a quantum computer, you know, that was doing something that we think is classically hard, right? So what kind of test can we apply to these strings? Well, we, we do have the huge advantage that we know the circuit C, right? We know the challenge circuit C. And so um, what, what Google ended up doing was a very, very simple test that they called linear XEB or the linear cross entropy benchmark. And this is simply, um, they, you know, using their classical computer and a lot of uh, uh, time, they calculate the ideal probability for each of the K outputs that they observe. Okay, that's this squared absolute value over here. That's if we had a perfect quantum computer, then what would have been the probability of getting the output S sub I starting from the all zero initial state, you know, and applying the circuit C. Okay, so we calculate those probabilities for all K of the observed outputs, and then we simply sum them up. And we judge the, the test to have passed if and only if that sum exceeds a certain threshold. Okay, now what should the threshold be? Let's think about that. Well, if suppose that Google was lying, they had no quantum computer, they were just generating all of these strings completely at random. Okay, well, in that case, we would expect you know, each of the probabilities, you know, of each of the S, you know, the S sub I's that they found to be about two to the minus N in, in expectation, right? Because they're all just random. And, you know, there are two to the N strings. So that's the average of, of the probability. Okay, so when we add up K of them, we would expect the sum to be about K over two to the N. Okay, now on, on the other hand, what if Google had a perfect quantum computer with no noise in it at all? Well, then it's a calculation that you have to do. Okay, there is some probability theory. You know, what, what, does it, what, what kind of uh, matrix do we get when we apply a random quantum circuit? But, you know, the long story short, we get a state that looks a lot like a uniformly random state. It's not uniformly random because it doesn't have nearly enough degrees of freedom for that. But, you know, in, in most statistical senses, it's close to random. And... Um, and, and, you know, we can do an integral, do a calculation and get that, that uh, you know, be, uh, uh, our, well, well, of course, you know, our, our, the samples that we see are going to be biased toward those samples that are supposed to be more likely, right? So we would never see an outcome that had a probability, you know, a predicted probability of zero, you know, and the, the strings with the higher predicted probabilities are just more likely to be observed. Right, just like if you um, sample, you know, a, a, a random person, you know, you're likely to pick a person from like a more populous state than from a less populous state because there's just you know more people there to be sampled. So, um, and when you do the calculation, you find that the expected value of this sum would be about two k over two to the n. So exactly twice the trivial classical value. Okay, now what Google reported in its experiment was an observed value of this sum, which was about k over two to the n times 1.002. Okay, so in other words, they are just slightly above the trivial value. You know, they are not even close to the ideal quantum value. Okay, but you should really think of this like the early experiments that violated the Bell inequality, right? So like you have a classical value, you know, you know, which is you think is the best that you could do classically, you know, we'll come back to that, right? But your goal is to just do anything, get any value that you can prove is bounded above the classical value, okay? And crucially, you know, they were able to get extremely high statistical confidence, like 10 or 20 sigmas or something that, you know, that this 1.002, you know, really is greater than one, okay? So they really are bounded above the classical value. Okay, now uh, John Martinez, who was the leader of the group at Google that did this, uh, likes to use uh, the analogy of speckle. So if I took a, uh, a laser, you know, and I sent it through some ground glass, and I looked at where the photons could end up on a screen behind the ground glass, I would see a kind of messy pattern where, you know, there are some places where 
uh, the photon is a little bit likelier to appear because there's more constructive interference. And there's other spots where it's less likely to appear because there's more destructive interference. Okay, now what this means is that even if I could only pass a few photons through the ground glass, as long as I knew this specific speckle pattern, I could test you know, whether my ground glass was really you know, uh, behaving the way it was supposed to behave by just saying, do my photons preferentially land on the red parts of this diagram, right? Do they preferentially land on sort of the places where there's supposed to be more constructive interference? That's very much what's going on here, except that instead of a screen, we have this abstract space of two to the 53rd power or of nine quadrillion possible output strings. Okay, uh, but roughly speaking, you know, you know, every one of the output strings we expect to be exponentially unlikely, right? So over the whole lifetime of the experiment, we never expect to see the same string appear twice, okay? Uh, but all of the strings are not equally unlikely, right? So some of, some of the strings might have a probability of occurring that is twice or three times the probability of some other string in the ideal you know, uh, uh, experiment. Um, you know, in fact, the probabilities themselves, you can calculate that they will behave like exponentially distributed random variables. Okay. So you know, they have a mean of two to the minus n, but they have you know, quite a bit of variation around that. Okay. And so we are looking you know, to, to, to check if you know, we are seeing the, if we are preferentially seeing the outcomes where the quantum interference you know, or the cancellation of all the amplitudes was a little bit less perfect so that those outcomes were supposed to have probabilities that were a little bit larger. Okay, now, as I'm sure many of you saw, just a few weeks after Google's paper uh, leaked, uh, a team at IBM, which is you know, maybe Google's main competitor in superconducting qubits, uh, published a response you know, IBM's first response was to say, we reject the entire concept of quantum supremacy because all that matters is sort of solving problems faster for, for customers, right? And, you know, and I had thought that that was just kind of a weak response, like, come on, right? But uh, a few weeks later, they actually had a paper with a, you know, a, I guess a scientifically stronger response, which was, well, you know, we don't think that Google has achieved quantum supremacy anyway. And, and their argument was as follows. That if you take Summit, which is literally the largest supercomputer on the planet, it was installed by IBM just a year or two ago at Oak Ridge National Labs. Uh, it fills the area of two basketball courts. And crucially, it has 250 petabytes of hard disk space. Okay, now this machine turns out to have just barely enough hard disk space that you could store a vector of two to the 53 complex numbers explicitly in hard disk, okay? And you could then just dynamically update this entire thing. And if you could commandeer this entire machine, then their estimate was that you could thereby simulate the Sycamore chip in a mere two and a half days, okay? Which of course is a lot better than 10,000 years. Okay, now I should say that IBM never actually did this because you know, it's not that easy to get this time on Summit. Okay? But you know, they estimated that if they had access to it, then they could have done it. And I'll, 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 you know, I, I regard that as perfectly plausible. And I think that it is embarrassing for Google that they missed this, that they were not thinking about you know, what, you, what could you do with that much hard disk space. They were only thinking about you know, writing everything into, into RAM. Um, but you know, you know, when you write it all to hard disk, you can do this sort of trivial, what I call the Schrodinger simulation, just the Schrodinger equation, right? But it's crucial to understand that even here, you know, you're still, you know, the, the simulation is still two to the n, right? So you're not getting past this bottleneck of needing exponential time to simulate the chip. It's still, you know, order several orders of magnitude slower than the quantum computer itself especially if we take into account that the classical computer needs to use hundreds of thousands of cores in parallel in order to do this. Whereas, you know, and, and much more electricity, by the way, 
whereas the quantum computer is just the one chip. Okay, so, um, you know, the way that I like to think about it is like, like it, it, it's, it's a, if, if this is the strongest object, uh, uh, rebuttal, then it's a little bit like the IBM, ver or it's a little bit like the Kasparov versus Deep Blue chess match, except with the historic irony that IBM is now put into the position of Kasparov. Okay, they're saying like with heroic effort, you know, we could just barely, you know, get within striking distance of the thing we're trying to simulate with, you know, the, literally the biggest classical computer that is now available. But, you know, if that's the case now, then we can comfortably predict that in a few years that even that is no longer the case. Okay. So, um, you know, and, and now, now sort of the, the theoretical computer science question, if you like, is, well, is that two to the n barrier really inherent here? Okay, now if, if someone could come up with a way to simulate the sycamore chip that you know took time polynomial in n, right? Or you know that did not have this two to the n barrier. Like you know, I think you know that that really would just completely kill the claim of quantum supremacy, right? Uh, so you know we, we don't know the answer to this question. In some sense, you know, it is too much to hope for that we could prove the answer in the current state of mathematics because you know in complexity theory. We can't even prove statements like p is not equal to p space, right? Uh, where you know if 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 those statements were false, then surely you know certainly you could simulate quantum supremacy experiments easily with a classical computer. Okay, um, uh, but uh, in a, a sequence of works uh, with uh, some students, um, um, uh, like a uh, uh, Li Ji Chen and uh, and Sam Gunn. Uh, uh, we were able to give some complexity theoretic evidence that there really is a two to the n barrier for uh, classically simulating these experiments. And the, 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 the upshot of what, of what we showed is that if you had a classical algorithm that could spoof, let's say the linear cross entropy test that Google was, was applying and do it in much less than two to the n time, then from that you could also get a fast classical algorithm that would take a random quantum circuit and that would estimate a specific output probability in that circuit, like the probability of the all zero string and do it with variance better than the trivial estimator. So in other words, there is nothing special about this problem of, you know, uh, about this linear cross entropy benchmark that is going to make it like trivial to spoof. If you can do that, then you have to get some leverage on the more general problem of just simulate a random quantum circuit, right? Which, you know, maybe you can do that when there's, you know, you know when things are noisy enough, but, you know, certainly it would require an algorithm uh, that would go beyond any of the algorithms that we currently know. Okay, so now the, maybe the biggest objection that has been raised against these quantum supremacy experiments, you know, these sampling based experiments was, is that even if they work, well, all they're doing is they're generating random strings, right? Which if you haven't seen some random bits here, here is what they look like, okay? And, you know, now it's true that the bits are not uniformly random. Uh, in fact, it's the tiny deviations away from uniformity that are the entire thing that we're looking for with this linear cross entropy benchmark, right? They're how we know that the experiment worked. But we had to go to heroic effort even to test, even to tell that the output bits were not uniformly random, right? And so, you know, if all we're seeing is, you know, just a whole bunch of mostly random bits, isn't this completely useless for any application? Um, you know, and, and, and until very recently, I would just cheerfully accept that, you know, yeah, it is, you know, we're just trying to disprove the skeptics here. But then a couple of years ago, it occurred to me that random bits are actually not obviously useless as long as you can prove to a skeptic that they really are generated randomly, okay? So this leads to my uh, certified randomness protocol, which is maybe, you know, the first proposed application for these um, uh, sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments. And the idea here is that, you know, let's say that we generate a challenge circuit, we send it to a quantum computer, we ask the quantum computer to output samples, to pass this linear cross entropy benchmark and the quantum computer does it and does it quickly. Okay, then what, what has the quantum computer proved 
by doing that? Well, you could say, first of all, it is proved under some computational assumption that it really is a quantum computer, that it's not secretly a classical computer, right? That was the original point, okay? The observation that I made is that under a further computational assumption, it's actually proving something a little bit more than that. It is proving, you know, because even a quantum computer, we, we don't expect that it would be able to quickly generate strings that pass this linear cross entropy benchmark in any way that is much different from just run the circuit, make a measurement, sample a random string, right? In which case, the quantum computer will be generating a lot of genuine entropy, genuine randomness, right? So you have a sort of certificate of randomness because the quantum computer past this linear cross entropy benchmark, okay? And um, um, why do we care about having a certificate of randomness? Well, you know, there's lots of reasons why people might wanna trust that their numbers are really random. You know, anytime you're generating a private key in cryptography, you know, and um, you might not wanna rely on a pseudo random generator, okay? But also, uh, uh, you know, there are applications where you might want to have bits that are announced over the internet to the whole world and where, you know, you have a, some kind of proof that they are random. So um, proof of stake cryptocurrencies, which are these, um, 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 you know, uh, systems that try to do kind of what Bitcoin does, but without, you know, in a much more uh, environmentally friendly way. So without using like 1% of the world's electricity to invert a hash function. Okay, so the, uh, uh, these, uh, you know, the, the next generation Ethereum is an example of such a cryptocurrency. Okay, the, the biggest, um, you know, uh, a stumbling block with these is that they require a giant lottery to be constantly run, you know, in order to basically decide who gets to add the next block to the blockchain. And so you need a huge source of random bits that everyone trusts are really random because you know billions of dollars are riding on it. Okay, so you know you could you can imagine different ways to get randomness that everyone trusts. Like maybe you point a telescope at the sun and you look at the little granules that form on the surface of the sun. Okay, but you know they're all you know all the ideas that you could think of are a little bit exotic, right? And this is this this is another idea for getting certified randomness. You use a quantum computer that can do this sampling-based supremacy experiment, uh, you check that you know, it really is doing it. Now the check is exponentially expensive, right? So that is a big drawback of this proposal, okay? But the check can be, can, you, know, you only have to do it much later and you can do it at your own leisure you know, using your classical computer. And in fact, you don't even have to do the check. You just have to credibly threaten that you might do it, you know, it just in order to keep the quantum computer honest enough that it really is, you know, uh, doing these quantum computations that produce genuine randomness from, from sampling from this output distribution. Okay, so uh, there are a lot of exciting places to go next. Uh, maybe the biggest theoretical open problem in this whole area is, is there a way to do sa a, a sampling-based supremacy experiment on a near-term device like the one that Google has but in such a way where we could actually efficiently check the answer with a classical computer so that we're not constantly playing this cat and mouse game of, you know, it takes two to the end time to uh, simulate the quantum computer, but it also takes two to the end time to simulate the results, right? You know, or to, to sorry, to, 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 to verify the results, right? We would like to get around that and have a much faster way to verify the result maybe by, by smuggling some secret into a quantum circuit that looks random, okay, in such a way that we could then efficiently recognize the output. There have been some creative proposals for how to do that, which, were, which have since been broken. Uh, you know, I would love to have a sound proposal for how to do this. Um, can we replicate Google's result in other hardware platforms like trapped ions with better fidelity and so on? This should not be seen as the end of the journey, okay? Um, can we design better classical simulation algorithms, possibly even good enough to refute Google's supremacy claim, right? Because quantum supremacy is not like landing on the moon, right? It is more like, you know, beating Kasparov at chess, right? Or beating the best human at chess. It's a milestone that could be achieved and then unachieved, 
because it's all about beating classical computation and classical computation can fight back. Okay, so it's very important to study this. And there is some work, you know, has been some exciting work just in the last year, designing better classical simulation algorithms, most of them applying only to small depth. So, so none of them threatening the Google result yet, but we need more work in that direction. On the other direction, we would like better theoretical evidence that spoofing this linear cross entropy test actually is hard for a classical computer. And then can we take my certified randomness scheme and make it more practical? As one example, could we get more and more random bits by sampling with the same circuit over and over rather than needing new circuits, which would enormously increase the, uh, the rate of generating random bits. Okay, so to conclude, uh, Google has apparently, you know, modulo the assumptions that we talked about, achieved quantum computational supremacy using random circuit sampling on 53 qubits, you know, building on a lot of allegedly useless complexity theory that, you know, a lot of people did over the last decade. Um, now, even if true, this leaves the huge challenges of scalability and fault tolerance, which have not been achieved yet and which Google and IBM and all of the others are now racing toward. But I think that it already refutes those who said that quantum speed ups are impossible in our world, or at the very least, it puts the ball firmly in their court. Okay, it was thought obvious for years that sampling based uh, quantum supremacy experiments had no applications beyond refuting the skeptics. Uh, things like my certified randomness protocol might change that although a lot of challenges remain in making it secure and practical. Okay, so I thank you for listening. I apologize for going a few minutes over and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Scott. Uh, this is really wonderful. Um, and I think, uh, I, I hope we were connecting with the broad audience here. Uh, there are a lot of people who have been uh, watching from the YouTube channel. And I think uh, there have been a, a buildup of a bunch of questions. I'm going to let Ke, uh, who's the co-executive director, um, be the MC for the questions. OK. Um, do we want to first open floor for um, the panelists? Uh, in sure, Israel? yeah, we can yeah. do that also. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah well, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, maybe, maybe um, anyone on, on the Zoom call can ask first and because we do have quite a lot of questions from YouTube. Um. Yeah, this is uh, Sergio Sanilevich, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. So not surprisingly, uh, you know, whatever we can do to help on classical computers doesn't have to be summit, can be modest ones like we have in, uh, you know, Exceed. Um, like to know about it, both in trying mm -hmm. algorithms and in, uh, you know, so uh, yeah, let us know and okay. uh, be happy to help. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there is lots to do for classical supercomputing people in terms of, you know, benchmark performance benchmarking yep. and, you know, and then sort of, you know, uh, both the, you know, sort of uh, beating the quantum supremacy experiments and verifying the quantum supremacy experiments, you know, and ironically, those are sort of two sides of the same coin right, yep. right now. Yeah. Oh, um, can I just ask some about something in your, your comment about how it's, it would be exciting if we couldn't build a quantum computer and it'd be exciting? Yes. And I'm pretty sympathetic to that. I mean, here, here's the thing I'm nervous about. There's a sort of worry that maybe we can't build it for boring reasons. I mean, here's an analogy. Is it is it possible to build fast, for, to do fast relativistic space travel? Um, I mean, it's pretty clear yeah. there's no interesting reason why that isn't possible. But it also looks like a difficult engineering challenge for yeah. all sorts of No, people. this is this is this is this is true. I mean, I mean, you could always, you know, have have a world where you know quantum computing is possible in principle, but it is just too hard to do for the next million years, right? And you know, look, I mean, I am, you know, when, when people ask me to estimate, you know, how long it will take until we have useful, truly useful quantum computers, you know, as they often do, what I say is, you know. I don't know how much longer our civilization is going to last. I mean, like, especially this year. Like, oh my God, just look, you know, look, 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 look around at the world, right? You know, how much more time do we even have, right? And, and uh, um, you know, and, and then on the other side, you look at things like GPT-3 and you think, 
maybe we're actually close to the AI singularity, right? And we'll all just, mm -hmm. you know, upload our brains and, you know, have uh, uh, quantum computers and all the rest, right? But, but uh, um, you know, so, so there are all kinds of unknowns about the future of civilization, of, you know, economics, of technology, of politics that, you know, that, that I don't know how to forecast, right? But the quantum computing skeptics who I was talking about actually go further than that, right? And they, they want to say that there is some fundamental reason why this cannot be done. So right? this could be exactly. sort of analogous to the arguments you saw before fault tolerance came along that so yeah, they, 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 they want to say that a quantum computer is something like a perpetual motion machine, you know, that, that, you know, it's sort of, you know, which is ruled out by thermodynamics. They want to say that there is some deep principle that just rules out a quantum computer. And you know, the, the main problem is that, you know, at least as far as I'm concerned, they have not been able to articulate what that principle is. You know, I think that it's worth, you know, it, it's good ha to have at least a few people think about it you know, try to come up with such a principle. You know, I'm glad that some people think about it. Um, but, you know, the results of it have, have you know, if anything, and we, you know, made me more confident that there is not such a principle, right? Or that, you know, a, 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 at any rate, you know, not one that follows from any of the uh, physical laws that we currently know about. Uh, but, you know, look, I mean, you know, when you, when you try, anytime you try to do anything in the real world or any experiment, you know, there is a possibility that you won't learn A and you won't learn not A, you know, and it will just be that, that you know, a fire will destroy your experiment or that you will run out of funding or that, you know, or that, or that you know, it will fail in any number of boring ways, right? But uh, um, I think that, you know, whatever is the ultimate truth of the matter, it can't fail, it, in, in some sense, it cannot fail to be interesting, right? Yeah whether quantum computing is possible or whether there's a deep reason why it's not possible. And, you know, I am very um, um, supportive and very optimistic about the effort to, to try to learn the truth of the matter, even, even if it is not guaranteed to succeed. You know, I would say that it has come a very, very long way in the last 20 years, and it has not yet run into any obvious obstacles. Any other question from the audience? Um, if not, maybe I can start with the, uh, we have a very, very enthusiastic and active group of uh, more than 80 people watching from YouTube. Great. And uh, due to the concern of time, I will try to, um, uh, maybe we cannot cover all of the questions they have, but I will try to give each person at least eight, one question asked. And, uh, yeah, and I, think, I think one question per person would be so we can get to as many people as we can. Right. Um, yeah. And um, the first question is that actually it seems from a, a student who recently applied to UT Austin in hoping of taking your class. Hmm. Uh, and uh, his question regarding the quantum computing in one slide, that slide you, you were talking okay. about at the beginning. And yes. he's wondering, uh, is this being discussed related to random walks? Uh, I mean, I didn't really have to say anything about random walks uh, uh, for this. I was just define, you know, uh, hand wavingly defining what is the quantum model of computation. When people use the term random walk, what they usually mean is applying the same unitary transformation over and over again, okay, to some system. You know, they usually mean further that that unitary transformation is local, like it's spatially local in some way and it is acting on something like the position of a particle, you know, on a line, on a lattice, on a graph, something like that. That's what people mean by quantum walk. So a quantum algorithm could be a quantum walk, but it could also be something much more general than that. Like it doesn't have to be spatially local and it doesn't have to be the same unitary over and over again. You could keep changing the unit. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and the second question is um, from a theoretical, theoretical perspective, uh, which approach do you think will be better, uh, the trapped ions or the superconducting qubits? Uh, there is not a way to answer that question from a theoretical perspective, right? From a theoretical perspective, they're both equally good. They're both equally great if they work, okay? 
uh, right? They are both aiming toward the same endpoint, if you would like, which is this complexity class that we call BQP, bounded error quantum polynomial time, right? You know, to do, you know, basically universal quantum computation, you know, anything that you could do with any other quantum computer. Okay, so it is, it is truly an, an engineering question of just, you know, which one will be able to get there first. Or, you know, it's even possible that you will want a hybrid of approaches, you know, that some qubits will be, you know, at least certainly in the near term, uh, that, that, that some qubits will be better for some applications and others will be better for others. Right, right now, like what we've already found is that a lot of these hardware approaches have complementary uh, strengths and weaknesses. So for example, the trapped ion qubits have way better coherence times than the superconducting qubits. Okay, like, you know, they can last for even like a second, okay, as opposed to just tens of microseconds. But the disadvantage is that the gates are a lot slower. Okay, so if you look at like how many layers of gates can be done, before everything decoheres, then, then, that, then that, that is similar in both of the approaches. And with the superconducting approach, maybe you have a little bit better control right now. Um, but you know, you know, the, you know, the with the superconducting approach, like every qubit is different from every other. So if you actually talk to the experimentalists, like they will like know the personality of each of their qubits. Like, oh yeah, like qubit number 14, that one acts up a lot, right? <laughs> You know, which, which, which you totally don't want when you're building a, you know, a, a huge computer, right? The, tra you know, the, the trapped ion cube is because they're all, you know, atomic nuclei, they're all exactly the same as every other one, right? But also because they're nuclei, they're very tiny and they're very hard to control and they can get lost, right? Which, you know, your currents on your, you know, your, your little coils on your chip, those are not going to get lost. Right, so, so, so there's all sorts of advantages and disadvantages that you could talk about of trapped ion versus superconducting, but in some sense, none of them are theoretical. They're all about the engineering issues. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, another question is, um, is there anything like descriptive complexity theory for quantum computers uh, analogous to, for example, the fagging theory mm -hmm. or any other alternative um, of that sort, for example, for BQP? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's an interesting question. Um, I have thought about it. You know, I've uh, even had students who wanted to think about that as a project. The short answer to the question is no. Uh, no one has been able to come up with a descriptive characterization of, of, of quantum computing. Uh, for, you know, for, those, for those who don't know what that means, it basically just means it's a way that you can characterize certain complexity classes in terms of like logical expressibility, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not clear, you know, how much we can do with it that we, we, we couldn't do otherwise, but, it, but it, you know, if nothing else, it's a very elegant, you know, alternative perspective on complexity classes. It works for classes like P, NP, uh, P space, uh, but uh, but um, um, no one knows a descriptive characterization of BQP. And there is even a simpler question than that that we already don't know the answer to. No one even knows a descriptive characterization for classical randomized computation, okay? So for, for BPP, okay? And I think until you would, you know, quantum computing, right? BQP is really just the quantum generalization of BPP. So until you had a descriptive characterization of randomized polynomial time, I wouldn't even bother trying to look for one for quantum polynomial time. I would think that randomized should be the first step. Thanks. And mm -hmm. another question is, um, what do you think are the best quantum advantage tests to do next uh, in addition to the, uh, the random query generator? Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's another very good question. And, you know, and unfortunately we sort of have like a gap, I guess a, uh, a, 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 a desert you might call it, right? So there was, you know, quantum supremacy, which as we you know, mentioned is, is, you know, only really works with up to about 50 or 60 qubits, unless we can invent a, a way of doing it where you can quickly verify the answer, right? And then we could scale that up to hundreds of qubits and then that would become the next thing to do. But if we can't, then, you know, then, then there, there, there's sort of an inherent limit to how far we can push these sampling based quantum supremacy experiments. And then like 
all the way on the other side of the desert, there are the things like Shor's algorithm and Grover's algorithm that might well require a fully fault tolerant quantum computer, right? So what can we do between now and then? I mean, by, I would say that by far the best candidate that we have is various kinds of quantum simulations. So, you know, learn, build a programmable device with 100 or 200 qubits that we could use to learn some new things about condensed matter physics, or better yet, even, you know, learn, learn some new things about chemistry, about chemical reactions, right? And the test is, can you bring those things to the condensed matter physicists or to the chemist? And, you know, is it something that is interesting to them that they didn't already know? And, then, and where they cannot easily reproduce the same knowledge using a classical computer, okay? And I think that we're gonna have a real shot of, of, of doing that over the next decade. It's not guaranteed that it's gonna happen, but there is a shot at that. So that would be you know, maybe the most obvious milestone to aim for next. And the, but beyond that, there is just the obvious thing of demonstrate useful quantum error correction demonstrate quantum error correction to keep a uh, logical qubit alive for longer than the underlying physical qubits are staying alive for. And that, as I said, people are racing toward now. When I talked to the folks at Google, they were optimistic about being able to do that within the next few years, which, you know, I don't, you know, I mean, I mean, to be an experimentalist, you have to be over optimistic. Right. So, you know, I don't know how long it will really take, but, you know, that is something that people are going to be trying for as well in the coming years. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And in considering of the time, maybe we have one final question. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is from uh, Shrita student, David. Um, in short terms, what is the largest number we can uh, currently factor or the largest database we can visit using the Groover? Uh, yeah, so um, I think that the largest number that has actually been factored using Shor's algorithm has been 21, okay? 21 has been factored into three times seven with high statistical confidence. Have we verified okay, and, Excuse me? Have we verified it's the correct factorization? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So right. So I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, the the the, the more interesting part is to verify that you know that the that the, that the quantum computation that did a cheat in some sense, right? That you know that it, it was not you know it, it was not pre-programmed knowing the answer, or that you know that it act you know that, that that what it did is actually recognizably Shor's algorithm, right? And you know there were there were some much larger numbers. I think even like some six-digit numbers that people factored, like using the D-wave machine. You know, and, and then people made a big deal about that at the time because that was you know that seemed so much bigger than 21. But th there they just used quantum annealing, right? And so there they basically just encoded factoring as a SAT problem, right? As a like an NPR complete problem. They threw out everything about factoring that could make it, you know, asymptotically easy for a quantum computer, and they basically just did a brute force search, right? So, so that that I viewed as as a complete cheat, basically, because that you know the fact that the quantum computer worked, you know, need need ha have had nothing whatsoever to do with it being a quantum computer at all, right? Like a a classical stochastic device would probably have done just as you know, a very similar thing just as well, okay? So, uh, so, so, so I think that, you know, we should, we should look only at the Shor's algorithm example. And then, you know, people, people just kind of got tired of it after 21, I think. People be, you know, I, like it's quite possible that today we could do it for, a, you know, a larger number, you know, maybe even a three or four digit number, but uh, um, no one seems all that interested in doing it because it wouldn't really demonstrate any new principle because we know that it's all going to fall apart until you can get to fault tolerance, right? So I would say that the, you know, and, 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 and likewise with Grover's algorithm, I mean, people demonstrated that you could search databases of size eight, size 16, and, you know, you could probably do a larger one, but it's all different flavors of circuits trick. You know, until, you know, I mean, I think 
um, you know, I mean, some people called quantum supremacy itself a circus trick, right? I thought that that one was actually a trick that was well worth doing just because this one actually establishes a point that, you know, you're doing something faster than a classical computer can do the same thing, right? You're establishing that it's possible at all that you can do that. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, I mean, I think that the real goal to look at is not the size of the number, the, fact, the, the factor, the size of the database, it's the progress toward fault tolerance, right? Because once, before you have fault tolerance, everything you do is gonna fall apart sooner or later, right? You know, including quantum supremacy experiments, by the way, certainly including Shor's and Grover's algorithm. Whereas after you have fault tolerance, then in principle, you could just add as many more qubits as you want. You know, and then, you know, it's, you know, you could, you could factor a, a, a number with millions or billions of, of, of of digits if you, if you if you cared enough to. Okay, thank you very much. I think sure. in considering the time, we will uh, end the talk and thank Scott again for a really nice talk. Yeah, well, thank yeah. you for inviting me. Yes, thank you, Scott, on behalf of uh, the entire PQI member mm -hmm. membership. Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, yes, yeah, th thanks for listening. And as I said, uh, you know, I, uh, I really, really hope uh, to uh, visit Pittsburgh in person as soon as possible. And uh, 